All right, what's happening, y'all, man? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and y'all know, man, I'm Mr. Optimistic. I keep it real, but I always try to see the bright side behind everything. And even though this season isn't over, I think this is a good time to just take a step back and look at some of the positives from this season. Now, of course, I'm not blind, so there's a lot of negatives. I may do a video on that. We'll see. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed. There's a lot of issues going on from top to bottom, whether it be front office, coaching staff, players especially, our future, what we've done this season, injuries, COVID. I mean, there's so many negatives to take away from this. I mean, most importantly, we're not going to make the playoffs like that. I mean, we're not putting together winning football, especially these last few weeks. We go on losing streaks, then a win streak, and then a losing streak. We don't really lose or win inconsistently like that. We're either winning a lot or losing a lot. So, of course, this was not a great season, but there are 20 things that we can take away as positives from this season. Some are things that happened this season. A few are what's going to happen next season based on what's happened this season. So, there's definitely 20 things to be happy about as a Washington football team fan moving forward. But before we dive into that list, of the 20 positive things to take from this tragic 2021 season. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell next to the subscription button so you get a notification immediately. And every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one, we're getting to that part of the season where, of course, I'm gonna give y'all the weekly updates on injuries. We're gonna get back to live streaming during the games. There's only two games left though, the Eagles and the Giants. That means we only have two post-game live streams, but I will hold some live streams where y'all can call in throughout the offseason. Of course, it won't be every week like the regular season, but it's not like that's going to die. And then, of course, with us getting to the offseason, y'all know I'm going to come out with my most creative videos, especially my draft talk videos, my team building videos. You know, I get in the GM mode, but we also have to do some review videos. I'm planning on doing some film sessions on specific players from this past season to take a look at what they did right, what they did wrong, what we may be able to expect from them moving forward forward going into the 2022 season and beyond just all kinds of stuff like that so definitely stay tuned for the off season y'all know that's when i make my most creative fun and thought provoking videos my most debatable videos as well so the mock drafts are coming the live streams again will not stop anything major that happens or anything draft wise i'll probably go back to just holding the weekly sunday live streams we may miss a couple of sundays but just because the regular season ends does not mean street score season ends at all we'll hold the weekly sunday live streams for like an hour or two and we'll just discuss whatever's going on so just remember just because the burgundy and gold season Season is coming to an end does not mean this channel is so without further ado let's get it Well, it's time to talk about these 20 positives again there were a lot of negatives coming from this season there are a lot of negatives but we have to take a look at the bright side and look at 20 positives. And I'm not making these up. Y'all may disagree with like a handful of them, but some of these are like actual real positives, especially if you really watch the film and isolate things. We have to remember that we are one of the, if not the most hurt team in the NFL, whether it be injuries, guys going to IR, like, and not just guys, but like really important Pro Bowl level talent, starter level guys that are currently on the IR. And, and then again, COVID hit us like a ton of bricks harder than probably any other team in the nfl at least top three so it was just like the worst case scenario for us as far as the lack of bodies to even throw out there on the field and so you have to learn how to isolate certain things like even though we're down to fifth stringers this guy looks pretty good and he's doing well in this environment with not much help around him you know things like that so let's go ahead and dive into it number one Scott Turner actually has learned how to score in the red zone as of late. That was just an uncrackable code for us for years, even dating back to the Jake Gruden era. And even though he couldn't do it consistently all season, this year has definitely given me the most hope in this specific area that I've had for this team in years. Give Scott Turner our franchise quarterback and a fully healthy offense, and I believe we can actually be efficient in the red zone because, again, we saw it at times. 
even with all of the holes that we have on our team specifically the offense we were still finding a way to score in the red zone fairly consistently after we hit that hump i mean that chiefs packers run when logan thomas was hurt was like the worst red zone efficiency i've seen from this team in a while but then shortly afterwards we started to see some of the best red zone efficiency we've seen from this team and again i'm not even just looking at statistics i'm talking about film we're down there scott turner's calling the right plays guys are executing and i believe once we have the right pieces in place scott turner can be the right offensive coordinator to make us efficient in the red zone number two speaking of scott turner scott turner has also shown how logan thomas will be a top five tight end in the nfl when healthy if he can stay healthy an entire season he's going to make the pro bowl and the reason scott turner is involved in this is because i mean not all tight ends are just travis kelsey not all tight ends are george kittle as far as talent it takes your offensive coordinator to learn how to use them I mean, Austin Hooper, I tried to warn people, he's not that great. The Falcons made him look great because they just decided that they were going to hit him as often as possible. Red zone? Julio who? Calvin Ridley who? We're going to hit Austin Hooper in the red zone. And Scott Turner has cracked that code as well as to how to unlock Logan Thomas and get him heavily involved in the offense. It started a little rocky, but then he started to get him involved in the offense quite consistently then logan thomas got hurt then when logan thomas came back i mean he came back like he never missed any time scott turner was getting him the ball especially in the red zone and i'm just excited about the future of logan thomas because again if he can stay healthy scott turner has proven that he can get a lot out of that guy and he can put together a pro bowl resume for sure next season again if healthy number three terry mclaurin is officially different i mean a lot of us have been saying this since we drafted him not necessarily like as soon as we drafted him but his rookie season somewhere in the middle of his rookie season we started to realize hey man like this guy is different it started a little bit in training camp but then really his rookie season during the regular season we started to really see like hey we may have something special on our hands like this may be the best receiver we've had in several years and then i feel like this year only proved it even more because us as a fan base first of all we're more unified on this subject because some people were even saying in the offseason that terry mclaurin may even be a wide receiver too on other teams and i mean i just didn't understand that i've been saying terry mclaurin is a top 10 receiver in the nfl for a couple of years now but most importantly now he's starting to get more nationwide recognition and even guys that aren't washington football team fans i mean guys are pro football focus guys at espn guys at bleacher report guys at fox i mean all over the place guys that like really watch film and actually look at every team and don't only just watch their own team and it's not just a pure fan of that one team that actually is objective and watches all of the receivers around the league and actually notices how horrible or good each receiver's quarterback situation is and the situation around them as far as other weapons to take attention from them there's a lot of people out here gaining a lot of sympathy for terry mclaurin in his situation you have guys at pro football focus espn all over the place basically screaming out please get terry mclaurin another receiver next to him that can take away double teams and a quarterback most importantly lead they can get on the ball when he's open i mean taylor heineke got people out here thinking trevon diggs is really locking terry mclaurin down and it's ridiculous and there's people out there even outside of our fan base that are seeing this and so i felt like this year was a positive because even though terry mclaurin has still suffered from pretty inconsistent quarterback play at least people outside of our fan base are really starting to take notice that hey man this guy really has top five receiver potential it's just hard for him to put up those stats because the situation around him is literally as bad as it can get in the nfl speaking of terry mclaurin i mean there's a chance that him and antonio gibson may each reach a thousand yards this season of course terry mclaurin as far as receiving and antonio gibson as far as rushing now granted it is a tiny bit less impressive of an accomplishment now that there's one more game a season but i'm still happy for them and it's definitely one of those very few bright spots coming from this season shouts out to both of them if they're able to reach it they have two games left as long as antonio gibson doesn't fumble as long as taylor heineke can stop under throwing terry mclaurin i believe they both can reach it we'll see number five the washington football team has made great low-key free agent signings since the rivera era jd mckissick most notably who's on the screen you also have charles leno who looks like a franchise left tackle we'll see how long like will it be the next three to five years or will this be like a short-term thing where we re-sign him next year and then got to look for another one i don't know but so far charles leno looks like a great pickup at left tackle Cornelius lucas is a great pickup as a swing tackle and he can start at right tackle left tackle if there's an injury so that was a great pickup eric flowers bringing him back he honestly put together you could almost say a pro bowl level resume 
resume this year and was one of our most consistent offensive linemen. And then William Jackson as of late. I don't know why Jack DeRio had him in so much zone coverage early on. And we've clearly seen through the Landon Collins ascendance, through William Jackson finally learning the defense later on in the season, that it just seems to take guys a little while to adjust to the Jack DeRio system. Some guys even take more than a season. And so William Jackson looked a little ugly in the beginning, especially in the middle of the season. But as of late, he's actually looked pretty good and has found his way in this defense and is really shutting guys down. I mean, he just doesn't get thrown towards much. Quarterbacks just target the receivers that are being covered by pretty much anybody but William Jackson at this point. And that's a great sign. Also, DeAndre Carter, not only as a receiver, but as a returner as well, has been a great pickup for this regime. Then Kendall Fuller, at times, you know, he either would had a great game or a bad game. He didn't really have anything in the middle. But at times, Kendall Fuller looked like a great sign in this season. Then, of course, Logan Thomas, can't forget him, with the top five tight end potential when healthy. Adam Humphreys, in moments when we really needed them, made plays, and then Wes Schweitzer should be starting for another team easily, and we have him as a backup. He started at right guard for us, he started at center for us this season, and he played very well at both positions. Sadly, he's on IR, he's one of the very many, including Logan Thomas, who's on IR, and that's one of the main reasons we've been losing games lately, because we have a lot of really talented, really productive guys on IR, but Wes Schweitzer's assigning has been a huge get. I mean, he was a backup for the Falcons on their O-line, and their O-line wasn't even good so I don't know how John Moscow was able to take that guy and turn into what he is right now and to just see the potential in him but I mean he went from being a backup for the Falcons to he should start on an NFL offensive line honestly shouts out to Rivera and his team and his coaching staff and these scouts and these GMs for doing a good job of finding talent in free agency especially for cheap all of these guys are on bargain deals logan thomas just got paid relatively big money but that was after he got technically re-signed speaking of signings man we finally found a kicker i mean this was so important that it had to go in a separate point because this is technically a free agent signing from this rivera era but like man this one was huge we have dealt with four kickers this season alone. Dustin Hopkins, because we released him. Chris Blewett, because we released him. Then Joey Sly, the third kicker, came in and looks like a franchise kicker. Like, it looks like we may have finally found a kicker. And then he got hurt, so then we had to bring in a fourth one in Brian Johnson, and then he was a great emergency option. If we never had Joey Sly, I would be okay with moving forward with Brian Johnson. I still prefer Joey Sly, but Brian Johnson as a fourth kicker in an NFL season in one singular season is crazy. For him to do what he did, I mean, some teams have had the same kicker for like around 10 seasons. We've had four in one season, and for the fourth one to come in and actually kick well, is tremendous for us shouts out to this team for finding those guys most notably Joey Sly again because he looks like he's a potential franchise kicker but Brian Johnson should be on speed dial if we ever need him moving forward then number seven speaking of new additions even though I believe this draft class is still too young to judge and grade as a whole right now it has overall been bad like just objectively it's been bad but there are some bright spots while healthy Samuel Cosme was having a Pro Bowl level rookie season John Bates, while every tight end above him on the depth chart has been hurt, has emerged as a great player and I can easily expect him to be a very quality tight end too and to be that final puzzle piece to allow us to run a diddly duo of tight ends, a diddly 12 personnel lineup like Scott Turner wants to with Logan Thomas. Now Logan Thomas finally has a tight end opposite of him that can actually contribute consistently. Ricky Seals Jones started to, you know, show a little something something, but I believe Logan Thomas and John Bates is our diddly tight tight end duo 12 personnel moving forward also before this mysterious over the course of a few weeks concussion situation benjamin st juice looked like a third round gym and i'm excited to see what he looks like in the future cameron cheeseman is a pro bowl alternate as a sixth round rookie long snapper shaka tony and dax milne also showed some flashes and deami brown after finally getting healthy made a nice play in the dallas embarrassment and he also made some really impressive highlight level catches throughout the season he wasn't good overall but there's something to build on there number eight also the development of the pre Rivera era players like a Chase Roulier becoming a Pro Bowl level center I mean he was good before Rivera got here but he's only gotten even better then Cole Holcomb having the best season of his career he's developing he's turning into a really fine linebacker Cam Sims made plays when he was finally targeted I don't know why he's not targeted much but it seems like when the ball is thrown towards him he's gonna make something shake and so I'm just happy to see that that he's sticking onto the roster and making plays when he gets the 
opportunities. And then, most importantly, Landon Collins at linebacker, man. Like many of us were saying for years now, and it turned out to be huge, but Landon Collins at linebacker is big time right now. I mean, I actually want to keep him. He needs to take a huge pay cut. He shouldn't be top three paid safeties in the NFL, but I would love to have Landon Collins on this team long term in the role that he is currently in well before he got hurt i love how landon collins currently fits into this defense again he needs to take a big pay cut he's not worth all of that money we're paying him but if he were to take a pay cut i would love to keep landon collins here long term and i thought i'd never say that because i thought i was just ready to move on like get him off the team i don't care if he'll take a vet minimum deal it's just time to move on but landon collins has shown that jack DeRio now knows how to use him he fits perfectly in that scheme when we lost him the injury we saw how much we truly missed him with us trying to use several guys just to fill in his one singular pair of shoes in the defense so man shouts out to this regime for finally figuring out the landing collins mystery and getting them to just finally deal with being a linebacker i mean granted he still plays a little bit of safety but in the offseason he was acting like he refused to play any linebacker and he would basically just throw a fit if he had to but now he's accepted that role he's excelling in it good job jack DeRio, rivera and everybody else involved also number nine and this one's huge because he's been so great after making an entirely separate point from the rest of the guys that were here before the Rivera era that have only gotten better since Rivera's been here. Jonathan Allen has made his first Pro Bowl and fully deserved it. I mean, big time. Second in votes in the NFC, only behind the great Aaron Donald, who you can still argue is the best defensive lineman or defensive player or player in general in the NFL. So shouts out to Jonathan Allen for putting together a great 2021 season. You still have two games games left to continue to outdo yourself and do some career personal best but man hey man congratulations to Jonathan Allen man that's a huge deal man especially because we paid him big money gave him that big contract extension and he didn't fall off the face of the earth he actually did the exact opposite of what most people do after they get their money they tend to get complacent they're like I already made it I'm a millionaire I'm set for life I'm good my family's good why do I need to go out there and put in the extra effort why put in those extra push-ups in my set when you know i'm already a millionaire i'm good i can just do the bare minimum and keep it pushing as long as i look like i'm trying as long as i put up a certain amount of stats i'm gonna continue to get paid but no jonathan allen went out there and got even better he's starting to turn those crazy amount of pressures into sacks because these past couple of seasons jonathan allen has actually been one of the league leaders in pressures at least top 10 he just wasn't able to turn those into sacks but this year he's finally gotten that extra split second of burst whatever he's doing the the moves the the technique whatever it's taken he's finally turning those pressures into sacks and it's been huge for this defense this season so shouts out to Jonathan Allen that's a huge positive from this season now we're at the halfway point number 10 the fun of Taylor Heineke if anybody's thankful for it, it's me, man. I really appreciate Taylor Heineke. Not a franchise quarterback in my eyes, but nobody can deny that this season wasn't fun and at least somewhat special. I will never forget the roller coaster ride of this season. Some Washington football team seasons have been forgettable. This is not one of them. Even with as bad as our record is right now and the fact that we're not on track to make the playoffs, I mean, of course, that sounds like a forgettable season, but when you actually take a deeper dive and look at what happened, happened this season man the Taylor Heineke experience was unforgettable this roller coaster ride of a season was insane and Taylor Heineke was definitely in the driver's seat of it one thing I will always appreciate Heineke for is the Falcons win in Atlanta that game means the most to me honestly with how much I hate the Falcons honestly probably more than any other team in the NFL and with how it happened to the comeback the touchdown at the end when we thought we were going to get a field goal and how the Falcons were winning pretty much the entire game and we were down like double digits at one point I mean and then with the fact that I was at the game and then also the fact that we only play the Falcons every four years so now they can't tell me nothing for at least the next three years shouts out my boy Taylor Heineke from Gwinnett man doing it in the city that you're from too in front of your family and friends yes sir so definitely one positive thing to take from this season if you don't take nothing else is the roller coaster ride and the fun of taylor heineke again he's not the answer at quarterback in my opinion especially moving forward especially long term but 2021 man i really appreciate the fact that we had a taylor heineke number 11 rivera has shown that this team can play with heart despite all odds and all of the players we have been missing this team has at least shown some fight and it shows that they believe in the Rivera era 
we had some very impressive wins this season most notably the tampa bay game where scott turner put together a 10 minute game winning td drive to not even allow tom brady to have a chance to make a comeback to have a game winning drive and we were severe underdogs going into that game but this team believed in rivera they believed in what rivera was preaching and that every week is a new week and we're not afraid of anybody and they went out there and proved it a couple of games this season i mean the defense stepping up big and the seahawks and raiders wins I mean, we had some really improbable wins that, I mean, it wasn't even just talent. It was heart. It was the will to win. It was the want to. Rivera definitely had these guys playing inspired football this season. Maybe not the entire season, but at moments you can see where if we just get the right talent, Rivera going to have these guys balling out for sure. And speaking of the defense stepping up, they showed that they can actually play well against elite quarterbacks at times. Our 2020 defense, while elite, did not have to play against great QBs. And so there was always this question as to whether this defense actually was elite or not. I mean, going against the Ben DiNucci's of the world, how good was this defense in 2020 actually? Well, this year, but we played about all of the good ones, man, about every top quarterback in the NFL. And they got the best of our defense a few times, the majority of the time. But this defense stepped up and played big against some of the elite or at least the really good quarterbacks this season. In a loss, with Antonio Gibson basically gifting the Chargers a game-winning touchdown, the Washington football team defense still held the Chargers to one of its four lowest point outputs this entire season. They also actually played pretty well overall against the team with the best QB to wide receiver duo in the NFL, the Packers. The offense made it very hard for the defense to play well, and our defense still held the Packers to one of their five lowest scoring games this season and in that sweet middle of the season after the new additions to the defense and Jack Dorio finally starting to get things figured out starting to get their chemistry together and right before the injuries hit this team like a ton of bricks they played very well against the Bucks the Seahawks and the Raiders in that four game winning streak and they were one of the main reasons we were on that four game winning streak again it was like the perfect middle we started to finally figure things out Jack Dorio finally started to learn how to use his players they finally started to learn where they belonged in his system and what they should do what they shouldn't do what they should look for all of that type of stuff and and before all of the injuries and COVID started to really hit us that middle where everything was in sync our defense started to look elite again they were making huge plays and clutch stops in that four game winning streak against the Bucks the Panthers the Seahawks and the Raiders I mean even the Panthers game one of the very few games Christian McCaffrey has been healthy all season they made some very clutch and big stops against him and cam newton his best game he's had in years honestly so if you ever need any hope for this defense as far as moving forward 2022 and beyond go look at that four game win streak and see what this defense looked like when it was at its healthiest and at its least confused once guys finally started to learn the jack the rio system and that bye week did us wonders it seemed like a lot of guys just came back after the bye week and were like oh i get it this is what jack the rio wants me to do so we had like a nice little period of time where everybody had everything figured out and everybody was health and so again moving forward go watch film on that four game win streak for the defense and you can start to get an idea of how good our defense can truly be number 13 speaking of that four game win streak this team finally wins close games in clutch time a lot of that was taylor heineke but in general this team has finally shown signs of life in clutch moments late in close games you know usually we fold when it's like late game situations when it's a close game whenever we play somebody in the result of the game is less than a touchdown we're usually like almost always the team that's on the losing side but we actually put together some clutch wins we even hit game winning field goals this season number 14 this team also finally wins primetime games when the lights are bright and everybody is watching it isn't an automatic l anymore for us i mean it's crazy to say but it is real we didn't win them all but this season has shown that it's at least not impossible anymore for the washington football team to win games when everybody's watching when nobody else is playing we've finally gotten over that hump at least rivera has a really good record in primetime games since being our head coach so i'm gonna give him the majority of the credit for that number 15 this offensive line was top five in the nfl 
even after injuries hit us really hard. Then it eventually fell apart these last couple of weeks, but I mean, only after we got to our fifth string center, our third string guard, and our first string right tackle just got back. So he was a little rusty because he had not played for us since the Panthers game. John Moscow almost deserves coach of the year consideration for what he's done with this O-line this season. We have been one of the most hurt offensive lines, if not the most hurt offensive line. And yet statistically, if you look at a lot of advanced statistics, pass blocking efficiency, run blocking efficiency, all of that, we are a top five offensive line in the NFL. Actually top three. It's like literally the Rams, the Eagles, and us in a tier of its own, and then every other offensive line in the NFL. Again, that's amazing because that includes weeks where we've had a fifth string center out there. Number 16, you gotta be happy about this complete front office makeover. The entire Bruce Allen regime, most importantly, Bruce Allen, is gone. Dan Snyder's still here, but another positive to the season is that this is by far the least hands-on Dan Snyder has been since owning this team. No more impulsive decisions, no more forcing his head coach and GM and scouts to draft a quarterback that nobody wanted to draft but Dan Snyder himself. And the fact that Dan Snyder called that pick in from his yacht is crazy. I would never expect him to try to pull something like that with Jason Wright and Ron Rivera on this team. Now, this front office has made a lot of mistakes, but it's definitely a huge improvement from the previous regime before, and they're working on it. I'm optimistic about the future of this front office. We'll see how they treat this name situation. Number 17. Another very big bright spot to take from the season is that we made history in a variety of good ways, most notably like Jennifer King being the first African-American female assistant position coach in league's history and the first full-time black women coach in the NFL as well. She also became the first black female coach to be a lead position coach in an NFL game when she stepped up as the running backs coach for Randy Jordan in that Cowboys embarrassment after COVID hit our entire coaching staff. People forget that not only did we not have a lot of players available in those games, but we also lost a lot of coaches due to COVID-19 as well. So we couldn't practice throughout the week. We couldn't make real adjustments in the game. And shouts out to Jennifer King for stepping up as the running backs coach and making history, man. That's big. Number 18, even even though the refs clearly wanted us to lose a lot of games this season and they were completely one-sided some games we were still the sixth least penalized team in the nfl and i give rivera a lot of credit for that for keeping us disciplined Again, because, I mean, we could clearly go back and look at the tape and see how much the refs were not rocking with us this season, and yet we still found a way to be the sixth least penalized team in the NFL. Number 19 with injuries, inconsistent play, and just straight up just bad football on multiple levels. I feel like we have a very clear picture of our biggest needs, and maybe Rivera and company will finally take filling those needs seriously this time around. Because usually at the end of seasons, we kind of debate, oh, we need this, we need this, and we rarely agree as an entire fan base and even though we're probably still not going to agree in totality as a fan base I feel like we're definitely more focused on a select few needs as a fan base this offseason and again I feel like Rivera and company will finally take filling those needs seriously this time around I've been saying we need to take finding a franchise quarterback seriously for years now, even before the Haskins debacle. First of all, I didn't like him in the draft. I wanted Brian Burns and to wait for a QB the next year because the class was so bad. And even just the fact that we waited till he fell to us. Usually when a team lets a quarterback fall to them in the middle of the first round, it's not going to work because it's a mix of he fell for a reason and also it shows that we didn't really want him it was more like well he's here so why not just take him and try to see what happens and you cannot approach anything in football like that especially the quarterback position but then once he was here i would figure hey we might as well give him an honest chance because he had an arm but it was never the right move to draft him or anybody from that draft class as a quarterback where we were in that draft unless we were going to trade up and try to get Kyler murray it just wasn't worth it but again i've been screaming go hard on quarterback for years and i'm glad that some of y'all are finally starting to wake up and hopefully rivera is one of them and we have some pretty clear needs outside of quarterback as well but quarterback is the most important for sure and i think this offseason for the first time in a long time the majority of the fan base will agree because i've been debating with people up and down for the past couple of years that you need a quarterback it's not the 1980s and it's been different points as to some people just feel like quarterback isn't important I strongly disagree with that. And then some people felt like we already had a franchise quarterback on the roster. I've also disagreed with that, even though I could see that point better than I could see we don't need a franchise quarterback to win a Super Bowl in the NFL. 
And then lastly, number 20, since we didn't spend much money in the 2021 free agency and will subsequently have top five cap space because of that. And now that we are slated to have a top 10 pick, maybe even top seven after all of this losing, we have plenty of ammo to fill those needs. Everything is in place, but the plan and the aggression. I really hope they attack every need with purpose this offseason, please. And if they want to, they have all of the money, all of the cap space, and draft capital to do so. Also, meanwhile, and I'm going to do an entire video on the NFC East cap space situation because this deserves a separate video. But like I said, we will have top five cap space and the Eagles, Giants, and Cowboys are all in the bottom 10. And the Cowboys are even in the negative as of right now. So if there's one positive as far as which team in the NFC East can truly turn this, turn their team around and make huge improvements in this 2022 offseason is us because of our draft positioning. And again, we have top five cap space while the rest of the NFC East has bottom 10 cap space. And again, the Cowboys are in the negative. Boy, them Cowboys better do all they can to win a Super Bowl this year because after this year, it's going to get ugly with their money situation. But yeah, man, that's the end of this video. Please get in the comment section. Let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video. Do you agree or disagree with any of my 20 points? Do you have any positives or points that you can bring up that I didn't discuss in this video and add to the list? Definitely let me know all of that in the comment section. And as always, please like this video if you liked it if you learned anything and also i appreciate all of the support man shouts out to everybody that pulls up to the live streams leaves a like big shouts out to everybody that pulls up to the live streams and donates man i really appreciate y'all also shouts out to all of my sponsors especially my pro bowl sponsors whose name you see scrolling on the screen right now man i really appreciate y'all i'll catch y'all later i'm out